Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Harkin. I'm a HOTUS professor and head of medicine at Kansas State University. And today I'm gonna present to you the results of a study uh, that we performed here in an evaluation of fortitropin in geriatric and senior dogs with reduced mobility. And this was just recently published in the Canadian Veterinary Journal um, and should be available for everybody in the next three months. So the problems that we um, were proposed or that we presented with is this loss of lean body, body mass and osteoarthritis contribute to decreased mobility in geriatric dogs. And not all pet owners have access to physical rehabilitation centers with experienced personnel. And because we certainly know that underwater treadmill and swimming um, and certain exercises with an experienced um, physical therapist um, can help our patients uh, maintain or restore some of their muscle mass and mobility, but not everybody has that opportunity and the uh, availability of a physical rehabilitation center. So what else can we do to help these um, pets live um, better lives with improved mobility? And the things that we knew is that um, fortitropin prevented the rise in myostatin and minimized the loss of lean body mass in dogs following TPL, TPLO surgery. Um, so a common knee surgery in dogs for um, anterior cruciate ligament rupture. And that study was done here at Kansas State University. Um, and most of those were young to middle-aged dogs with ruptured cruciate ligaments. But the question was, if we use the same product, could we help minimize um, lean body mass loss or even rebuild some um, muscle mass in our geriatric po population? And then this study, um, was, which was published in 2020, looked at the use of fortitropin in geriatric um, men and women. And it found also that fortitropin administration resulted in an 18% increase in fractional synthetic rate of muscle protein. And this is a relatively short study, but still in that relatively short period of time, it had a substantial increase in muscle protein synthesis. So our questions would, would fortitropin benefit the geriatric dogs with reduced mobility? And the other question is, do we have an objective way to measure the effect on mobility? Um, and I, I'll start by telling you that we wanted to use um, um, activity monitors in dogs. And we did start with some activity monitors that we, um, in our study, uh, but they did not work. So they were um, oftentimes gave completely erroneous results but fortunately for our study, we didn't rely just on the activity monitors. We also went with a questionnaire um, and a questionnaire that had been validated. And that was the load or the Liverpool Osteoarthritis Activity Index in Dogs, um, and the load questionnaire. And this was a client-based clinical metrology instrument that has been validated for the use in dogs with osteoarthritis and really uses kind of owner-friendly language to create a new numerical score associated with mobility. And although we didn't verify osteoarthritis in our dogs, the, our patients all had decreased mobility um, and clinical signs that would be consistent with um, osteoarthritis. And so that we felt that this load questionnaire would be simple um, and usable for our uh, patients. And just so you can read those questions, this is the left-hand side, and you can see many of these questions here. How's your dog's mobility in general? How disabled is your dog by their lameness? How active is your dog at exercise? How active is your dog? And these are really basic questions um, to generate the score. And, and this load questionnaire has been shown to um, correlate very nicely with force plate analysis in dogs. And this is the right-hand column there. So some other questions and really basic 13 questions. And ultimately we create a load score. And this load score can be as low as zero, which means a completely normal, healthy dog, or as high as 52, which would be a dog with severe uh, mobility uh, issues. So this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. So myself and Dr. Katie Hetrick um, involved in the study, we didn't know uh, what the patients were receiving. Um, the randomization um, was done um, by a, the a third party. Um, and so we would just follow the, um, the schedule on who received um, which product, product A or product B. Um, and clients, once again, clients didn't know what they were receiving either. The dogs could not have any disease that could affect six-month survival. So any patient with chronic kidney disease, 
um, kid, uh, liver disease, cancer, we excluded all those patients. So we really wanted patients that we know would still be around um, for at least six months, even though the study wasn't lasting six months. Um, dogs had to have um, at least three of these, lameness, weakness, decreased mobility, decreased voluntary activity, subjective loss of muscle mass, or reduced exercise tolerance. So as long as they met three of those criteria, they were included in the study. Um, and then we did load scoring. So I had owners fill out those questionnaires at week zero, week six, and week 12. We had 23 dogs that ultimately ended up with on fortitropin and 23 dogs on the cheese powder or the um, placebo. And these are really similar in their composition. So it's just in case you think there's a, a big difference in the protein, fat, and carbohydrate content. content. So the fortitropin is 33% protein. The cheese powder, powder is 36% protein. The fat the content of fortitropin is 55%. It was 48% for the cheese powder. And then the carbohydrate content is 7% and 4% respectively. So these are really identical, really close. This is a really good placebo. This is the same placebo that was used in the geriatric human trial. And once again, as I mentioned, these are where the load scores can range from zero to 52. Um, and then our statistician, uh, Jim Roush, was also blinded to the control and treatment groups, but we also blinded him to what the scoring interpretation meant. So we didn't tell him that a higher number was worse and a lower number was better. He didn't know what the scores meant. He was merely meant to compare the, the values. Um, and then our statistical analysis that he did, um, so the comparison of the load mobility scores between the two groups from week 0, 6, and 12, and the change in scores between weeks, 0 to 6, 0 to 12, and 6 to 12, those are all compared with the non-parametric t-test and the Mann-Whitney u-test. Um, and then within the each group, the load mobility scores were compared for each time period, zero versus six, zero versus 12, and six versus 12, with the Friedman's test for repeated measures um, over time. And we set um, significance at P less than 0.05, um, and all of our statistical analysis was done on commercial software. So this is this kind of the distribution. This table shows the distribution of the dogs. Um, in the different groups, in the fortitropin and cheese powder group. And you can see they're very similar. And that was part of our randomization to have a similar number of dogs in each um, weight, um, age or um, weight range. Um, so our large breed dogs, we had 11 in the fortitropin and 15 in the cheese powder group. Um, you can once again, see that breakdown of our dogs. We had a few more dogs in the small, uh, less than nine kilo um, group for the fortitropin, but these numbers are really, uh, really similar. And you can see the age range and the median age for dogs is pretty close um, for all um, groups also. Um, and then you can see this breakdown in the clinical signs reported by the owners. Lameness, um, pretty similar. Decreased mobility and our weakness. All these numbers are pretty similar across the board. And then once again, muscle mass loss recognized in 17 of 23 in both groups of dogs. And this is a very busy um, slide. I apologize for that, but this is our statistical analysis. And in the square is the big comparison here. And that is um, what you can see is the comparison of week zero versus six and zero versus 12 in the Ford Torpen group um, and in the cheese powder group or the placebo group. And there was a statistically significant difference in load mobility scores between week zero and six in week zero and 12 in the treatment group, but not in the placebo group. And you can see the P is 0.03 and 0.006 in our fortitropin group and, and 0.16 and 0.13 in the cheese powder group. Um, the control group had a larger range and interquartile range in the load scores for all three time points compared with the treatment group. And even though you can see we don't have a statistically significant difference in the load scores across the board, this variance is this huge variance in our cheese powder group or the placebo group is really responsible for why they don't see a statistical difference um, in their um, week zero versus six. But our variance is, is much lower and this statistical significance in the fortitropin group really appears to be um, important um, and relevant and statistically um, different, um, obviously in the, the fortitropin group. 
But if we wanted, we're, we did the numbers and did an additional power analysis. If we are looking for um, a statistical difference in the fortitropin and cheese powder groups, if we increased this with the same results, if we increased the 50 dogs in each group, it looks like we would have a statistical difference at that point in time. That's how many dogs we'd need. So 100 dogs was kind of out of our range of doing the study. 46 was a pretty good number, at least we felt. And once again, we still see a statistically significant improvement in load scores in the fortitropin group, which we do not see in the placebo group. Just kind of um, summing up, and there's a couple of um, quotes um, from different authors. And the first one, he says, sarcopenia, far from being a pathology of specialistic relevance, is a multidisciplinary and systemic health problem that involves orthopedics as well as geriatrics, internal medicine, and nutritionists. And you know, I believe that's true, is that you know, we just accept oftentimes sarcopenia as just a normal function of age, but I, I think we need to look at it as, as something that seriously impacts the expression of osteoarthritis um, and plays a role in um, the life and, and healthy life of our elderly um, dogs. So something that we really need to address um, and maybe need to address a little bit more significantly than we've looked at in the past. And this is a, a quote from uh, Dr. Jaffe at Mississippi State. And he says, to minimize sarcopenia and thus improve patient mobility, treatment by reduction of serum myostatin levels with fortitropin showed promise compared to a nutritionally similar control. Hetrick and others demonstrate a statistically significant improvement in owner assessed load mobility scores after six and 12 weeks of treatment compared to a placebo supplement Based on studies such as this, it is my opinion that use of a product that inhibits myostatin levels to reduce sarcopenia, such as fortitropin, fortitropin excuse me, should be considered a valuable component of multimodal management for the treatment of canine osteoarthritis. And multimodal, I think, is an important component of, of that and, and physical rehabilitation and underwater treadmill and exercise. But I think as stated earlier, those alone and exercise alone may not be enough to restore lean body mass and something that inhibits myostatin that uh, such as fortitropin is an important um, addition to this multimodal response um, to treat sarcopenia and manage canine osteoarthritis um, in our patients. So just to summarize sarcopenia and osteoarthritis, negatively impact the mobility and quality of life of dogs. And these are really um, uh, interrelated um, concepts of sarcopenia and osteoarthritis. And I would even probably put disuse atrophy also along with sarcopenia. So sarcopenia and disuse atrophy really impact um, osteoarthritis um, and vice versa. Fortitropin supplementation showed mild but statistically significant improvement of the mobility scores for the treatment group at both week six and week 12 compared to the baseline score, but no statistical improvement was noted at any time in the placebo group or between the treatment and placebo group. And I think once again, I, we felt um, that there was a significant improvement and patients that were um, evaluated um, in hospital, I recognize that COVID did affect some of our evaluations, you know, when, when um, they were evaluated by us and kind of a global assessment of how the patients were doing. Those patients that were receiving, ultimately found to be receiving the fortitropin, um, the, for the ones that came back, we found that eight dogs um, had, an, uh, we felt an improved muscle mass and eight dogs had stable muscle mass and we didn't feel any dogs had lost muscle mass in the treatment group or fortitropin group, as opposed to the placebo group where we only felt one dog had improved muscling and mobility, four dogs were stable and three dogs had lost muscle mass. So even in our assessment and global assessment of these patients on examination, we felt that there was an improvement in the treatment group as compared to the placebo group. And then finally in the summary, reducing sarcopenia through fortitropin supplementation can be a valuable component of a multimodal strategy to treat reduced mobility in geriatric dogs.